Thank you very much. Um, and I think the first thing to say is uh, thank you to HESS for funding this project. It's a three-year project funded by Historic Environment Scotland looking into the early Iron Age crannogs of Loch Tay. Um, the other place to start is that uh, this is uh, quite a team effort uh, collaborating across a number of uh, institutions, a number of uh, archaeology companies, um, uh, the Scottish Cranog Centre and the Scottish Trust for Underwater Archaeology. So I'm very much just the, uh, um, the mouthpiece today um, behind uh, a lot of individuals and a lot of organisational effort into this uh, exciting project. So um, Cranogs. Artificial island dwellings, um, the typical story is that they get uh, built in the early Iron Age sometime uh, and then they're repeatedly used uh, in some cases right up until the medieval period um, and the late medieval period. Uh, built of timber and stone, um, there's a bit of uh, uh, morphological characterization in the north and west. They tend to be mostly stone or all stone islands. Uh, sometimes with surviving superstructures like dunes and rocks. Uh, in most of mainland Scotland, uh, they appear as kind of these rocky mounds with uh, horizontal and vertical timber elements. Uh, and then in the southwest, uh, the, uh, they tend to, to come in the form of a more uh, packwork uh, style, which is to say layers of almost exclusively organic material uh, uh, accumulated on top of which some kind of dwelling sat. Um, but Cranogs are very much an, an enigmatic uh, settlement form in the sense that on the face of them, by and large, without anything particularly obvious like some medieval uh, masonry, uh, you couldn't say when they date from. Um, there's no kind of morphological uh, uh, distinction that would give you any kind of sense as to whether they're Iron Age or early medieval or medieval on their surface. So the way to get around that is um, radiocarbon dating or excavation. Uh, and the vast majority of chronological information that we have from Cranogs comes from kind of single or a handful of radiocarbon dates uh, uh, from exposed timber elements uh, on the lock bed that kind of poke out of the Cranog. Um, there is also a Neolithic uh, 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 phase of use that so far is mostly limited to Lewis, um, and we'll just swiftly forget about that. Um, but essentially, uh, 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 the kind of classic Cranog emerges in the Iron Age. And this is a very typical suite of Cranog radiocarbon dates. This actually comes from an excavated Cranog, Ederline, um, and it kind of demonstrates the, uh, the problem that we face. Even where you do have decent excavated context, you end up with a suite of dates like this. And if you were eyeballing it, you might say there's maybe three or four phases here. Um, you know, sort of a, an early Iron Age phase, uh, sort of 800 to 400 BC, something maybe 400 to 200 BC, something around the, the couple, first couple centuries uh, BC AD, and then an early medieval phase. Um, but this, there's potential in the nature of radiocarbon dating that this is masking a lot of uh, other phases. Those early Iron Age dates at the bottom there uh, might actually be representing three different phases unto themselves, um, masked by this smearing of the calibration curve that occurs 800 to 400 BC. Um, and this is kind of where our project Living on Water comes in. Um, so the aim of this project is to really build on the work that Nick Dixon has done at Loch Tay, investigating the 18 known Cranogs along the 14 mile loch that's more or less right in the middle of the country. Um, where we have uh, nine uh, Cranogs that have rangefinder dates from that 800 to 400 BC kind of early Iron Age emergence uh, of Cranogs. Um, and this is what they look like. And they sit on this period of the Hallstatt Plateau. And the question is, for the early Iron Age society that was building these things, is how many of them were in use at the same time, effectively? Um, are we looking at a very busy landscape along Loch Tay, where most, maybe all of the Cranogs in the Loch are being built around the same time? Or are we looking at a relatively dispersed settlement pattern uh, around the Cranogs, where you've got uh, a, a handful of Cranogs, maybe one or two or three, being built around 800, those fall out of use, and then a few more are built around 700, straight through that whole 400-year period. Because of the way radiocarbon dating works, 
we couldn't tell based on the present evidence before we started this project uh, what the situation was. Those radiocarbon dates effectively are unordered um, and there's not a whole lot you can do to overcome that. So to illustrate that, um, uh, you've got two Cranogs uh, uh, near the village of Firnan on the north shore of Loch Tay. Um, they both have plenty of radiocarbon dates, or Oakbeck certainly does, um, and Firnan does as well. And there is nothing to say that these two sites were in use at the same time. Um, it's possible that they were in use at precisely the same time. It's possible that the people who built these two structures didn't know each other and had no knowledge of each other's existence, separated by 400 years of time. Um, and so this is where we're getting into. Um, so we've been investigating, we've excavated at six of the nine Cranogs uh, that have these early Iron Age uh, rangefinder dates. Um, and the approach is to sample, uh, in the first instance, for dendrochronology. So we're taking kind of whole uh, cross-section samples of timbers that we've uh, uh, uncovered in the excavations. Um, these are then being um, uh, dendrochronolo dendrochronologically assessed by Anne Krohn, um, and then we wiggle match date uh, those floating dendrochronologies. Um, and this is going to address that early emergence. We should be able to get a hint uh, as to whether uh, Cranogs are being used closer to that 800 onset of the Hallstatt Plateau or closer to the 400 end of the Hallstatt Plateau um, and be able to get a sense of that sort of social history of Cranog dwelling. Um, you know, just how busy is that landscape and what are they doing? Because in addition, uh, we're getting good paleo-environmental in, uh, information from the exceptional preservation conditions that you find on Cranogs in these submerged contexts. Um, so I mentioned uh, wiggle match dating. Um, to explain that, essentially what we're doing is we're using the structure of the tree itself, um, and this is a good sort of example here where we've taken a sample of oak, um, and we're using the individual tree rings uh, as a guide. Um, so if we take radiocarbon dates through that, so rings 1 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 15, and so on, and we radiocarbon date those individually, we, can, we then have a statistical framework in which we can place those radiocarbon dates and get a much more precise answer. So we go from a one-off radiocarbon date that gives you an, a, a, a range of 800 to 400 BC, and we can bring that down in some cases to plus or minus 50, um, so down to kind of century resolution. Um, and depending on where we hit the calibration curve, in some cases we can get that down to uh, a decade or two in terms of date range and we'll get on to, to some of those results in a minute. Um, the other aspect of, of the approach of living on water is to really uh, use what Nick uh, has done at Oak Bank as a guide. Um, there's uh, the scale of work that Nick has done at Oak Bank is very much unprecedented in terms of Cranog excavations underwater. Um, uh, we certainly haven't been able to match uh, with our new excavations, what, Oak, uh, what Nick uh, has done at Oak Bank since 1980. Um, and the assemblage there and the amount of uh, area exposed on the Cranach has given us a real insight. So Oak Bank's kind of the, the center point around which a lot of our, our work revolves. Um, uh, the other work that we're building on is the work that Anne Crone has done previously with, um, uh, with the timber assemblage from Oak Bank. Um, and of course, she's adding to that dramatically with uh, the dendrochronological assessment of the timbers that we've sampled over the past couple of years. Um, so to sort of summarize uh, our results so far, uh, nine sort of small two by two meter trenches. Um, we found over 250 individual timber elements and that's you know kind of the more substantial stuff that you could actually sample. We've sampled 135 of those. Um, the vast majority of those have been looked at by Anne. Um, we now have um, not only the intrasite floating chronologies, so that's that dendrochronology that aren't necessarily pinned to a calendar date, but groups of timbers that we can say were felled uh, in one year or felled 20 years after another timber. Um, we have plenty of intrasite chronologies, but we now very excitingly have uh, at least a, a tentative uh, couple intersite chronologies. So that's timbers that actually match across Cranog. So one timber from one Cranog is matching dendrochronologically to another timber from another Cranog. Um, the earliest wiggle match date that we've been able to produce so far uh, is about 600 to 550 BC. Um, so this is uh, at least 50 years or so 
earlier than the earliest hints of, of Cranog use so far. So we've pushed back the emergence of Cranogs at Loch Tay um, by about 50 or 100 years uh, into the first half of the 6th century BC. Um, but what's perhaps a little bit more exciting is uh, in the 5th century BC, uh, there is very clearly uh, a, a lot of Cranog building going on. We can't say for certain whether that amount of crown building isn't taking place earlier, um, but we can say for certain that that 5th century BC, there are a lot of crown being built in Loch Tay and indeed uh, more widely. Um, so in our excavations, we've gotten all the classic crown stuff. Um, we got divers in the water. We've got really well-preserved timbers. Um, it's been a chance to go back to Oak Bank and sort of reassess what Nick's done, do some new recording on, on some of the features that he's found before. Um, and just to sort of highlight, uh, um, you know, just how fantastic the preservation is, um, you, know, you know, in a very small amount of sample, um, just sort of 1.5 liters, uh, this amount of uh, uh, paleoenvironmental information uh, has been able to be identified. Uh, and what it shows is, um, you know, really kind of a whole landscape being utilized. Uh, so we've got material that's being brought to the site uh, from the Loch Shore, so not very far away. Um, we have evidence for uh, cereal production, um, you know, sort of typical arable crops of the Iron Age, as well as some, um, some uh, uh, species uh, that uh, are relatively rare in the early Iron Age in Northern Britain, such as spelt. Um, we also have uh, material that is coming down from the tops of the hills, um, uh, and this is <coughs> potentially indicating you know, some kind of pastoral activity, possibly transhumans, uh, in the form of cloudberry, which only sort of grows above kind of 500 meters above sea level. Um, that's not necessarily a huge distance uh, away from Oakbank Cranog or any of the Cranogs in Loch Tay. Um, they are just up the hills, um, but it's, uh, it's very informative to be able to get that kind of specificity. It's not just an assumption that people or animals are going into those landscapes. We can definitely say they were. Um, from the excavation, uh, again, very typical of Cranog excavations, massive timbers and spreads of organic debris. It's very difficult to make a whole lot of sense of this when you're actually underwater. Um, a, the, and we'll come on to that in a second. Um, it's also very typical, although the conditions exist for it, it's very typical of Cranogs not to produce a huge amount of artifacts. Um, so while the Oak Bank assemblage uh, is, is very, very significant, um, it is not very, very large. Um, we're talking kind of in the dozens of well-preserved wooden artifacts. There's a small fragment of textile. Um, there's a few very exceptional finds as well. Um, however, it seems like, uh, and this seems to be the case as well at the excavations in southwest Scotland at Blacklock and Coltslock, that things are fairly clean and that artifacts tend to group into one place. So when we're putting our two by two meter trenches in, unless we get really lucky and put it right on the spot that the artifacts seem to accumulate, we're not getting a huge amount. Um, with that said, we have had a few, uh, a very nice pine taper, um, a uh, cornerstone, which actually wasn't in our uh, excavation trench. That's just on the surface. Um, so if anybody wants to go and visit it, you can go find it. It's at Milton Mornish Cranog. It is there. Um, and that brings me on to Milton Mornish. Uh, and this, I'll use Milton Mornish as kind of an example for, for how we're transforming that chronological picture of Cranog use. Um, because prior to starting, we had these two radiocarbon dates. Um, <coughs> As I said before, we can't really make heads or tails of those. They're simply 800 to 400 BC. If you want to get into the weeds of it, you might be able to, to pick out kind of 800 to 500 with this date uh, and 500 to 400 with that date. However, um, even at two sigma, we're still getting, um, we're still getting you know, these long tails. And that is um, just the nature of radiocarbon dating in the Hallstatt Plateau. Um, so our trench uh, had this was one of the richest trenches in terms of number of timbers, um, and it also produced some of the best preservation that we've had so far. We had uh, a group of oak timbers that were very well preserved right to bark edge with tool marks in many cases. Um, and three of these timbers, uh, assessed by Anne Crone, uh, uh, it, were felled in the same late winter, early spring. Uh, timbers 104, 106, and 107 there. 
Um, so that's that floating dendrochronology that I was speaking about. Um, so cut down in the same year, unclear exactly which year until we do our wiggle match date. So we did our wiggle match date on timber 104. Um, we had 12 radiocarbon dates through um, the 65 year uh, timber uh, annual ring sequence. Uh, and that produced the date here of uh, 370 to 355 BC. Um, so you'll notice it actually fell off the Hallstatt Plateau. We're out of that 400, uh, 800 to 400 period. Um, and that brings up uh, an interesting point, which I'll return to in a second. Um, but just to sort of highlight the complexity of, of the nature of these relatively small trenches is uh, we also did a wiggle match on Timber 108, which is right here, not, you know, kind of less than a meter uh, away from some of these other, um, uh, the group of three. And this produced the date of uh, 400 to 390 BC, the wiggle match did. Uh, so even within this relatively small area, we've got essentially two phases of use. Um, not necessarily discontinuous, um, you know, we're only talking sort of 40, 50 years here between these two timbers. So we might be looking uh, at these three oaks going in as a, uh, a, a, a repair, um, but not necessarily. Uh, everything that's come out of work on these later prehistoric uh, settlement sites is that the, the, uh, the amount of time uh, spent uh, in any one go is really not very long, um, you know, on the order of decades. So uh, we could be looking at a sort of continuous uh, amount of occupation here or a sort of a relatively short uh, abandonment and then a reoccupation uh, 30, 40 years later. Um, so to sort of summarize our chronology results so far, we've gone from this series of a bunch of unordered dates uh, to this. Uh, and this is very much just a summary picture. Um, uh, they're color coded. So we've got our 600 to 550 uh, roughly date. That's from Dal Bay South. That's that earliest phase. Um, interestingly enough, it's also probably in terms of altitude, the highest timber. Um, so this just sort of goes to speaking to the complexity of Cranog uh, taphonomy. Um, the earliest timber we have so far is the highest in, in the profile. Um, and it, uh, that also speaks to uh, the fact that the level of Locte probably hasn't changed a whole lot. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think, sort of perception in people interested in Cranogs, uh, and there's a few uh, things that are published about Cranogs that talk about uh, lock level change and it being a really big deal, particularly at Locte. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. The earliest timber we have is in about chest deep water um, and it's preserved to bark edge. So it probably has never been dry. Uh, and so I would say that the level of Loch Tay uh, certainly has never been lower significantly uh, than where it is today. And I doubt it's been higher as well because then we'd have evidence for a paleo shoreline and it's not there. Um, so at least from the early Iron Age, the level of Loch Tay is more or less where it's at. Um, Things get much more interesting uh, from about 400 to 350 BC. And this is where we have this real pulse of activity. Um, Oak Bank uh, has a phase of uh, construction around 500 uh, and with uh, uh, a few um, uh, uh, things going on through the fifth century BC, but things really get exciting at about 400 where essentially all the chronogs that we've looked at so far have activity taking place. Um, and so to sort of go through this um, kind of one by one, we have Dal Bay South. It's in use 600 or so, 600 to 550. Um, and as you can see as well, it has um, later phase of use. Um, please ignore, uh, slightly ignore this radiocarbon date. Um, that is a wiggle match date, but it's from a timber that does not have bark edge. So essentially there's an unknown amount of time from that uh, uh, point to when the timber was felled, and I suspect it's probably contemporary with 214 at that 600 to 550 period. Um, moving forward in time, the last few decades of the 6th century BC, we've got really good evidence at Oak Bank. We also have a hint of evidence at its nearest neighbor at Fiernan. Um, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of early medieval activity at Fiernan Hotel. Um, which has really obliterated the early Iron Age um, levels. But we, were, we do have uh, a, a layer that does seem to date to the 5th century BC. Um, and then 
there's that 400 to 350 period where we've got um, you know four uh, of the six sites that we've looked at uh, uh, that show really quite significant uh, amounts of activity uh, taking place um, between 400 and 350. And if you uh, imagine Fearnan Hotel having this kind of fifth century BC activity, uh, it's perhaps not unreasonable to think that that's actually um, spilling over into that 400 to 350 period as well. It's also worth noting at this point, so these, um, uh, these sort of uh, date ranges that are represented, they frequently aren't just an individual timber. These are these floating chronologies. Um, so this isn't just one timber. Um, this particular one uh, is representing two. Um, we have a lot of sort of paired uh, floating chronologies. There's also that are uh, also floating chronologies that extend into, um, you know, sort of double digit numbers of timbers. So these are representing, uh, you know, relatively uh, large phases of construction at these sites. Um, and there's a lot more that we can do with this and we're going to be taking that forward over the next 12 months. We're, we're sort of exactly two years into the three-year project um, and there's a lot that we can do examining the paleoenvironmental uh, evidence that we've collected from these uh, excavation trenches. Um, but just to sort of go into very briefly two things that uh, have emerged so far. Um, the first is uh, from the dendrochronology side of things we have wiggle matched radiocarbon dated timbers that we know date from the same period and have overlapping rings. Um, however, uh, dendrochronologically, they are not matching. Um, it's difficult to say uh, exactly why that's the case. Uh, it might be uh, reflecting uh, microclimates. Uh, this Locte is in, you know, effectively a, an alpine landscape, so if you have a, a timber growing on a south-facing slope versus a north-facing slope, that might produce a very different ring structure, and therefore they won't match dendrochronologically. Uh, it's possible as well that it's, it's reflecting um, uh, forest management uh, as well, um, and that sort of anthropogenic influence is sort of changing uh, the growing conditions and therefore uh, producing these um, timbers that we know are growing at the same time, but are growing so differently that they don't match up dendrochronologically. Um, now, this sort of pours cold water on the hope that we might be able to build um, a, a sort of master oak dendrochronology for Locte. Um, uh, it's maybe still possible. Uh, however, it's going to be relatively difficult and the number of timbers involved is going to be very, very significant, uh, requiring a lot more cranogs to be excavated. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is this kind of fifth century activity. Um, and uh, in particular from a sort of very specific practice uh, that took place on at least three chronogs um, separated widely geographically and in two cases separated by virtually nothing chronologically. Um, so I've put a picture up here of the fabulously excavated and now published Colts Lock excavation uh, where they found a wooden R chair uh, buried beneath the floor layers uh, of their packwork cranog. Um, and there is a virtually identical find from Oakbank Cranog. Uh, the dating of these two cranogs is essentially the same. They both emerge around 500 uh, and they seem to be in use through that 5th century BC, um, probably uh, without uh, any major phases of, of abandonment. Uh, and this is a very specific practice to my mind, to bury uh, essentially the same tool in the same place uh, on the same type of monument. Um, and that says to me that in this fifth century, in this early Iron Age period, um, we have uh, very wide shared cultural traditions. Um, and if you maybe expand that out a bit and, and assume that Cranogs are representing um, that shared cultural tradition, um, you can essentially apply that right across the whole of the country at this time because we find Cranogs essentially wherever you can build them. Uh, wherever suitable lock conditions exist, there seem to be cranogs, and we have early Iron Age dates from uh, essentially all regions throughout the country. Um, so that gets maybe potentially very exciting when we start to think about uh, wider European trends uh, and some probability uh, population models that have been very trendy in scientific literature recently um, regarding uh, you know, very massive population declines uh, in the early Iron Age to be followed by uh, increases in population around the 5th century BC, 4th century BC period. Um, 
exactly what that means is definitely unclear at this point, but it's worth pointing out that uh, the occupation of Cranogs seems to be part of this um, shared cultural tradition across the whole of Scotland, effectively, um, in the early Iron Age. Um, so just to wrap up here, um, this is a very important development for understanding Cranogs. Um, what we're doing is sort of cutting through that issue of uh, Cranog sitting at the periphery of archaeological narrative because it's so difficult to incorporate um, the evidence from them due to the difficulties with, with sort of placing them in time. Um, we're sort of being able to cut through that uh, as well as sort of uh, uh, address some other questions that are very specific to Cranog, such as their site development and taphonomy. Um, it is clear now that we have Cranogs at Loch Tay that are in contemporary use, and at least in the 5th century BC uh, and er in first half of 4th century BC, um, there are quite a few Cranogs in use at the same time. Um, so we're starting to build up a picture that Loch Tay, at least 400 to 350 BC, is, is relatively busy. We're also sort of <laughs> highlighting the fact that there is essentially nothing 800 to 600 so far. Um, perhaps it's just buried too deeply um, and we're not seeing it, um, but it does seem to be genuine when you look more, more widely. Um, there's essentially no firmly dated archaeological settlement in Scotland dated 800 to 600 BC. Um, we also need to think about the 400 to 200 BC evidence. Um, there's every chance that uh, there's another plateau across this period and there's every chance that actually um, things dated 400 to 200 would run towards 400. Um, so perhaps what might be uh, thought of typically as a second sort of phase of use is actually part of that same sort of around 400 phase. Um, and it also, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, about this sort of uh, early Iron Age settlement evidence being relatively thin on the ground, it speaks to the fact that Cranogs are relatively visible. We can find them. Um, and so if we're talking about finding early Iron Age settlement evidence, Cranogs seem to be a very obvious way to go forward. Um, and finally, uh, sort of the importance of this emergence of this phenomenon is that Cranogs go on to be used in much the same way in terms of being domestic settlement for, you know, essentially up until the present. Uh, in fact, uh, there is one Cranog that I'm aware of, or one possible Cranog, that is still occupied in Tyree. Um, there is a house on what was probably formerly a Cranog. Um, so it is, Cranogs as a monument group are sort of very important for that really long picture of settlement evidence. So, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, may I 